and salutations, listener. It is I, Eric J. Chucky, here as always with my fellowship. <laughs> the ring? Nice. That one's a little labored, my man. Well, you know, the other option was with my Samwise Gamgee, and no. <laughs> I think of the two of us, your Samwise, my man. Oh, hey, well, I see how it is. I don't know, I'm a little bit more doe-eyed. Yeah, it's true. Um, it's, well, this is, I guess, the Two Nerds Podcast. We're talking about Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit movies. Hey. Um, yeah, hey, this is the boy. So, before we get into it, if you could uh, give us your likes, them little thumbs up, they really help us out. Comments and subscribes and favorites are nice too, but I'm not going to press Mostly it. the likes. Mostly the likes. Um, also, if you could do our homeboy, Super Blizzard, a favor, go buy up all of his Shining Was Auto music, uh, Let's Get Hardcore is a theme song. And um, if you head over to his other pages, if you follow him on Twitter, look him up on the internet, you can find all of his games. And if you buy those, then he'll be even happier. And he will come to us and say unto us, White and the Boy, who are you? <laughs> no, he knows me talking on Twitter. I answer for the music. That's true. Um, and he, he will say thank you for all of the good things you've done. Here is one professional wrestler. Oh, do I get a pick? No. Oh. Uh, you're probably going to get Heat Slater, I'll be honest with you. Well, could it could be worse. Yeah, it could be worse. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so, all that aside, uh, welcome to podcast. So, we recently, last Friday, yeah. saw uh, The Hobbit... Uh, Battle of Five Armies. Um, quick spoiler free review. Uh, mostly this podcast is going to be about th- that movie, and since I don't know that either of us have an hour to fill on that movie, the Lord of the Rings series in general, um, also. But I'll, let's start off with a quick spoiler free review of that movie in specific. Not that anyone should really care about spoilers, it's The Fucking Hobbit. Um, spoiler free review. Yeah. Uh, I believe I will stick with what I said on Facebook. It was a good 90 minutes of film. That's very vague. Yes. Um, I would say it was probably the weakest of the series of Lord of the Rings movies. Um, I, yeah, I, I'm pretty comfortable with that. Those I don't I don't feel with what, what, what we're saying. I mean, our audience size aside. I don't feel what we say is going to stop anybody from watching this movie or encourage them to. Look, if you haven't seen any of the other movies, don't fucking watch this. Go watch the other ones first. You don't have to go back and watch all the Lord of the Rings movies. Just go watch the Hobbit ones. It's fine. Whatever. But don't watch the third one first, moron. If you have seen the rest of them, well, fucking finish it. It's, but it is still the weakest in the series. Go in knowing. Yeah, it's go in weak. knowing it's not, it's not strong. Um, uh, I'm not... Really worried about the customary time for spoilers. This is a this is the Hobbit. You should have read. Yeah, I mean, like if I were reviewing King Kong, I wouldn't give you because it's fucking King Kong. <laughs> Reminds me of a funny story. Do you think we have time for a funny story on the podcast? I think we do. There is a very strong acquaintance in my past, um, and uh, I was telling this strong acquaintance about the uh, Penny Arcade web comic strip um, from years ago when the Peter Jackson King Kong movie came out. And uh, Gabe and Tycho were talking about it, and Tycho's talking about it at the end when King Kong dies. And Gabe was all like, What? Spoilers? I didn't know! And he's like, There's a statue of limitations on these kind of things. You can't get upset about a movie that has existed for 20 years. I was telling this acquaintance of mine uh, about this comic because it was funny. And this acquaintance got very upset because they had no idea that King Kong died at the end of the movie. (laughs) <laughs> That's, that is art imitating life right there um, But, on to the, uh, the Hobbit and uh, the Lord of the Rings What's your general opinion of um, uh, the books than the films? Uh, the general opinion of the books is it's actually complex It is, like most nerds, it is this bellwether in my childhood It is a marker of... The moment in which I started reading more adult literature, it is a big step for a lot of nerdy kids. The the first time you get a hold of a copy of The Fellowship of the Ring and and read through it. And having read a lot of fantasy fiction in my day, a lot, um, I have to say, on balance, The Lord of the Rings, while probably one of the best stories, 
is not the best written. Tolkien was very obviously a linguist first, and a history uh, buff, a history professor, you know, first, before a storyteller. He would go on these rather dry sort of jaunts into history, which, while I enjoy them, being a history buff myself, can probably be a, a you know, a stopping point for a lot of people. It's one of the most dry prose I've read, next to The Count of Monte Cristo. Count of Monte Cristo was the driest book I've ever read in my life. But, and then the movies, I think, did really well to adapt it. They quickened the pace quite a bit. Um, they did some things that I have made peace with in the, what is it, 14 years now? I don't know. Yeah, 2001 was Fellowship, so yeah, going on 14 years. Doesn't seem like that long ago. But it was. Yeah. Um, but they were good adaptations. I think very solid, good movies in their own right. Um, because, you know, even people who've never read the books enjoy those movies if they've watched them. For the most part. There are a couple people who find them slow. Well, fantasy's not your bag. Fantasy's not your bag. Yeah, that's true. And haters gonna hate, nerds gonna nitpick. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's basically the premise of our show. Good night, everybody! <laughs> um, I have a similar foundation. I mean, I, I don't think... It seems incorrect to say that The Hobbit was the first, like, adult uh, oh. fantasy literature I read. I don't know about The Hobbit, but, like, Lord of the Rings, well, the there's, of the Rings. There's, a, there's a line. Yeah, you're right. Um... But I don't mean as in it's not mature enough. I just mean as in it's not... It wasn't like, I read other stuff yeah. first. But it was pretty seminal. Um, I got the entire series as a box set one Christmas from my stepdad. Uh, who was always quietly like, Here, have a The Hobbit. Here, your mom found this D&D stuff. Go, go be a nerd in the woods. <laughs> um... But, uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Uh, Return of the King really lost a lot of patience with me. Because that's, other than the opening of uh, Fellowship, where all the begats happen. <laughs> um, like the fucking Old Testament. Yeah. Other than the opening of Fellowship, the, the, the ass half of Return of the King is probably the slowest read in all four of those books. Hmm... I don't know. I mean, it picks up toward the end, but, like, when they get to Gondor and all that shit's going down, I just... You you drag in the Gondor yeah. parts? That's understandable. I was always interested in Gondor, so... I didn't give a shit. Of course, again, this is me. Um, when I read through the books, I thought that, uh... What's his name? Um... He's making a hitting motion? Swordy guy. Boromir. I thought he was a dwarf. Swordy guy. <laughs> That's what the hitting function was. Sordomir, everyone. Sordomir. I thought Boromir was a dwarf because he had a dwarfy name. And he was described as stocky and, you know. Yeah, I was like, okay, dwarf, I got it. No. Like, I guess I read over the parts where he was mentioned as, like, the king of men and this and that. and But, yeah, whatever. Um, You can go reading comprehension of a 12-year-old. Ooh. Uh... But I like them. They are great stories. I mean, that's the most important part. Um, and I believe the movie interpretations are... They're good. I mean, they're fine. They took out some of the stuff that I love from the books. But it was the kind of... It's nitpicky stuff. Like Bomberilla Dillo? No, I don't. I don't give a crap about Tom Bombadil. You don't? I don't. Weird. I I recognize that. <laughs> I, it was weird even when I read it. I was like, okay, this is this guy's strange. I am uncomfortable. Um, <laughs> is there an adult nearby? I am disappointed about the lack of a fight with a barrel white. Um, not just because it's partially my namesake, but. You know, that was a cool scene, and I think Peter Jackson could have made it really cool. Um, I don't disagree with that. I think I think that's very true. He could have made that really badass. Uh, and there's some lines that I was sad were removed. Or changed. Or changed, yeah. Um, Given to someone else. 
And maybe I didn't read this right, but I seem to remember that uh, when What's His Nuts freaked out and ran off the edge of that building, like, I didn't remember if they did this in the movie because I've only seen Return of the Kingdom one time because I only have so much fortitude. Um, <laughs> also, I didn't have it on DVD. Uh, but, like, doesn't his son get up and is fine? And he's, like, trying to set him on fire and stuff, and he's like, nope, totally dead! And his son's like, please stop, I'm okay. <laughs> and he's like... What? It's a meter car! And freaks out and runs off the edge. They tamed that down and made it a little less wacky in the movie. I love how wacky it was. I love that that's how fucking far gone this guy was. <laughs> and, uh, of course, I am Saruman of many colors. I desperately missed that line. Look, they were not going to do fabulous Saruman. Whatever. It wasn't going to happen. Oh, man. But, uh... Yeah, those are weird nitpicks, I know. But no, the movies did a good job. And I think The Hobbit, the first two Hobbit movies, did a really good job of um, both conveying the spirit and the tone of the books and all the stuff that happened in there, dealing with whatever studio mandate was, um, and adding stuff from elsewhere in Tolkien lore to just sort of pad out the three movies that were required of them. Yeah. And it was mostly, I mean, there was some weird stuff added. Toriel, um, in the Hobbit movies, is a completely original character. And I do not steal. But it, the rest of the stuff they added, most of it was, was stuff from Tolkien lore. Yeah. It's just not, wasn't in the Hobbit. Right. Uh, didn't, but for the, for specifically the Battle of Five Armies, didn't you really, like, there was that one, the middle, like, the beginning 45 minutes after the opening battle scene, right? Yeah. You hated that, right? Yeah. Uh, earlier I said this is a good 90 minutes of film, and yes, it is. 90 minutes of this film are really good. This movie is not 90 minutes long. It is a lot longer. Um, there's an opening battle, which I had my nitpicks with. I mean, the CGI in it just didn't look up to Peter Jackson's snuff. I need to make sure that I... Like, any other movie, and I would have been like, that's fine. In Peter Jackson's movies, hey, 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 you're Peter Jackson, come on. Um, And some of the changes they made with Bard shooting the arrows off the back of his son, like, stretched my suspension of disbelief to the point of snapping. Well, I'm pretty sure in... Oh, the big thing is they had to find a contrivance for him to shoot that big fuck-off spear. Because I'm, I, I, I've been years since I read The Hobbit, but as my memory serves in the books, he, it was a regular-sized arrow. I, if I recall correctly, yes. And it, was a, it was a fucking arrow. This is a, a goddamn javelin. His I, bow would not have been able to fire the goddamn javelin. And that, that's fine, and I respect that. I just thought him using his son was a bit odd. Like... Bard's character was all over the place between the two movies he was in, too. Like, he felt a lot more complete as a character in most of Battle of the Five Armies. That was the Bard I remember from the books. Um, you always say that. I don't fucking remember Bard from the books, like, at all. Oh, man, I love Bard. He was, he was one of my favorite characters in those books. Like, him, Thorin, Bilbo, Gandalf, and uh, uh, Gollum. Well, I mean, those are basically the characters in the book. You, well, Feely and Keely and Bone Baron, they don't... Man, they, were, they weren't characters. They were names. They were funny names. But uh, there are other characters. There's there's Druid Guy, ah, yes, who Druid. turns into a bear. A Druid Guy, yes. What was his name? Bearston or something? I'm not going to tell you. I, I Bjorn, Bjorn Bearson. <laughs> <laughs> it was. That's why you're not... Bjorn like Bernstein Bears. <laughs> Bjorn Bernstein bears and the and the troublesome orcs. <laughs> also dwarves, fuck dwarves too. Um, but they added a lot of stuff with the Council of the Wise, which is cool because that was a thing that happened off screen in the Hobbit book. That as a kid, I always wanted to know more about. I was cool with it. It wasn't actually those events that happened that I was upset about. In uh, in in uh, Battle of Five Armies, uh, I liked it through the rest of the movies, but it was the effects that bothered me. Yeah, they do. Uh, 
you know, anyone who's seen the original Lord of the Rings trilogy, if you haven't watched any of the Hobbit movies, you know how when Gladriel goes all all real talk, she gets like a little goth. When she starts using her power, she gets there's a lot of dark undertones to her skin, and her hair darkens, and all that. Well, that was was later in the in the timeline. This is earlier when she has more power, and apparently her power to goth ratio is one to one. <laughs> So, the more power she uses, the gother she gets. Which wasn't the problem I had. You know, okay, fine, she looks super weird, but whatever, she's doing a magic thing. That's a perfectly fine visual indicator of a magic thing is happening. However, the um, Sauron is doing magic back at her is what my issue was with. And the ghosts, the the not-yet-ring raids, they looked kind of shitty. Why did they not just do ring raids? That's what I want to know. Well, okay, and if you wanted to do them as the kings, fine. But use the same effect you used on the ghosts in Return of the King. To make them all spectrally and glowy goo. Glowy goo. This has been a fun podcast for turn. Ectoplasm. <laughs> I want, like, just a, just a separate recording of you doing that. <laughs> Put it on my phone. Uh, make it like... <laughs> My notification tone <laughs> emails. Ectoplasm. Oh, I got an email. <laughs> um, but yeah, they were just. I mean, it was just like a simple ass transparency effect. It wasn't anything special. The fight itself was cool, but I kept being distracted by like these amateur hour fucking ghosts in a Peter Jackson movie. And Peter Jackson is known specifically for his ghost effects. Well, he already did pretty damn good ghosts. A couple times, not just with Lord of the Rings. No, but yeah, he did before that. Um, yeah, I mean, they, that, those were the, look, the, the fucking ghost effects for the, for the nine uh, human kings, the, the ring raids, that was straight up, that was the worst effect in the, in the Lord of the Rings movies. <laughs> um, and then there was Sauron doing his magic, which was like, it was like one of those gifts you see on the internet that's supposed to make you like trip balls, but in slow motion, so it's not really doing it because you can't make your entire audience vomit. It was it. It was the exact effect they used, as you say, fifteen years ago. Yeah, it was the, the eye, the all you know, the all-seeing eye. It pops up and it zooms in on the on the pupil of the eye, which, if you get super close, is an outline of Sauron. Well, that that honestly looked a little funny to me, but then it, they they do an an infinity recursive loop, like like those gifs you see on the internet. Uh, he's right of like. You look into a mirror, and it zooms in, and there's another mirror, zooms in, and there's another mirror. They did a loop where if you, they go all the way into that pupil, and there's another eye inside, and they go all the way into that one, and all the way into the next one, so it doesn't flash. And then it flashed inverted, and, I mean, like, yeah, 15 years ago, we were on board. We've seen better shit since then. Yeah, but that's, and it, they established what that looks like. Fair, but it was also so far out of fucking left field. Like, no, they did it in the last movie. When did they do it in the last movie? When Gandalf was fighting Sauron. When he got his ass beaten and got locked up. Yeah, but that was like a flash. It wasn't like they're on screen for 30 seconds. They did it for about 10. That's still not 30. Like, that starts to wear thin after a bit. In giant high definition in your face. Flashy, 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 flashy. Was it just that it was, like, physically annoying to your eyes? No, no, it was just... I mean, it was... It was jarring in that it was, like, such a big... Um... What's the word I'm looking for? A tonal shift in what we were looking at. And because compared to everything else, it was... I don't know, like a... Like an effect you would find in a PS2 era video game. That seems a little harsh. I think PS2 is fine. PS2 had some pretty good graphics. Early Xbox, I would say. Early. Oh, no, that's not... Early Xbox wasn't that great. People didn't know how to design on it. Well, I would say late PS2 era. Oh, okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's fine. That's a little more fair. Look, I'm get credit where credit's due. I mean, for what it was, it looked just fine, but the fact that it was what it was is what bothered me. I mean, I, I understand it's what's established, but this is, sometimes you got to roll with the punches a little bit. And that they didn't there... I don't know that that's one of those places. Like, it bothered you. That's that's not one of the things I've heard complaints about online. I think that one was just, that's a personal pet. Yeah, thing. oh no, it might have been. I mean, you know. 
But it, it didn't help that I'd been sitting there going, what is this? Why? Why? For, you know, what, 30 minutes by that point? I don't know. I was, uh, I was sitting a couple seats away from you. I couldn't hear your haterade. I wasn't making any noises. My brain kept turning to me and being like, are you okay? Yeah, it's fine. Shut up and watch a movie. Oh, man, it was... I was just enjoying the movie. I'm glad for you. Yeah, it was perfectly fine. That, that, that 45 minutes he hates was not good. I'll say that. It was serviceable. It was, and it's the reason that he, that he uh, is right in saying first, and I corroborate, that is the weakest movie in the series. But that doesn't mean it was a bad movie. I would not say it was a bad movie. I would say it was a medium movie. I don't have the patience to watch Return of the King again. Never mind the, the time in which to do it, but... It's I don't, only like three hours if it's the extended, if it isn't the extended edition. Well, yeah. And, I mean, you know, that's going to be what I'm doing with my night, if that's what I'm watching. But it's just because I don't have the patience or the time set aside that I want to devote three hours to watching that one movie that is the end of a spanning story that I have more favorite parts in. Which is fair. I'd rather watch Fellowship again. Um, or Two Towers. That's good. Two Towers is okay. Um, I always liked it better than Fellowship. Although Fellowship has Boromir, I like the Sean Two Towers story. book better than Fellowship. That, that, that might be why I like the movie better because I also like the book better. And I, I like the first two Hobbit movies a whole lot. Yeah, people bitched about those, and I don't know why they were fine. No, like the weird stuff they added in and the effects and stuff, the stone giants, so on and so forth. That was all. That's all fine. Yeah, it was fine. It was whimsical. It's, it's, it was you know, fun. the book was intended to be whimsical. It's, yeah. They changed some stuff. You're right. It's, it wasn't a one-to-one adaptation. Neither was the fucking Lord of the Rings movies. Like, well, neither, were, neither were they. They weren't a one-to-one adaptation either. They changed a bunch of shit themselves. It was just more subtle shit. <laughs> oh, there's enough stuff to get people to bitch. Like I said, we're nerds. We nitpick. But, um... More than anything, it wasn't the content of the movie so much. It was the effects, and it was the way things were delivered, and it was... <sighs> filmmaking stuff that bothered me. And I, I call it that, because I'm sure I would have noticed it had I not been... were I not a person who was interested in filmmaking, but I wouldn't understand why it was bothering me. I would just go, I don't like this part. It looks wrong. It doesn't look right. I don't know, it was too stupid. I just didn't like it. Shut up, don't ask me questions. I understand why I don't like it. That was an awful place to start your movie. I don't know. They didn't have anything better, really. Although, if they had started with the with Gandalf and them fighting the ghost guys, that would have been okay. You get the same bang of starting And it starts off slower. Yeah. Um, There's that that's... build of tension instead of it just being, We're here! Look out a dragon! Small, well, they left off with small <coughs> wrecking shit, you well, know? They kind of had to get back to small wrecking shit. And I get why they didn't... I mean, to be honest with you, I know that the problem isn't that they started off their movie in the wrong place. The part of, the problem is that they ended the last movie in the wrong place. They wanted to end on a cliffhanger, which split up the smog, you know, the smog destroys that town, destroys Lake Town scene, which was the problem, because that last bit is the climax of the last Hobbit movie. They just cut it off in the middle. Yeah, no, I agree. And I can see why. I mean, A, from the marketing standpoint, that, oh, yeah, we gotta get that sweet, sweet cliffhanger money. Which I don't understand. No one's going, no one fucking doesn't know this story. Well, and even if they don't, I mean, are you really going in going, gosh, I hope, hope they stabbed that smog? Well, the, I think the problem is mostly that the, they, they were worried that if they killed smog in the end of Desolation of Smog, people would watch the next movie because, the oh, fuck, they killed smog, they got the thing back, it's over. Yeah, the mountain is there. Again, yeah, that was a point I was going to make as well. What else is there to really worry about? Um, Turns out lots of shit, but like... Well, yeah. Uh, and I also get it because the killing of Smog is, though they tried their best, still anticlimactic. I mean, Dragon terrorizes Lake Town, dude shoots him, he dies the end. And they stretched that out. Yeah, he had a dying scene that was just, just this side of, um, I forget the guy's name, the villain from, the P. 
Pee Wee Herman's character from the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, just this side. It was... <laughs> Oh, for I am slain, and I have been slain by the bow of a man. A bow man, if you will. <laughs> it wouldn't have surprised me if they'd done that. I'm going to be honest. Um, and like it, it also bothered me because they were trying to juxtapose like this wacky escape plan from Stephen Fry and Eyebrow Guy. Arthur, I think his name was. Or Archie, or whatever. Fucking Coward Guy. Yeah. I love Coward Guy. Coward McGuybrow. Coward McGuybrow became the best comic relief in the movie. I love that he gets away with everything. He just leaves. <laughs> he just leaves with his gold boobs. He's like, well, whatever. Fuck you, bye. <laughs> it's no comeuppance. Bard's just like, okay, we'll see ya. And <laughs> Amelin is the name of that uh, Paul Rubens character from... Uh, from... I had to look it up. I had to look it up, listener. It was gonna bother me. Um... I didn't like him at first, but he grows on he, you. He really does grow on you. He's the he, he was the surprise, the dark horse, if you will, of that film. Unibrow, um, I came to know him as Unibrow. Yeah, uh, but uh, they're trying to juxtapose all this serious shit happening with this wacky escape plan that goes awry, and even the serious shit that's happening, they're painting so fucking light, and I'm not asking for us to see like mangled corpses in the streets or anything like that. But there's a difference between, you know... Part of the reason The Hobbit was a cool kid's book, because it was a kid's book. Mm -hmm. I mean, not like, you know, baby's first fantasy novel, but it was still, you know, book intended for young for young adults, we'll say. Um, well, the thing that was cool about The Hobbit is the same thing that was cool about Batman in the Animated Series. It didn't pretend. It treated you like an individual who was capable of reading about and understanding complicated emotional situations, death, you know, high-risk scenarios, etc. It didn't need to pretend that everything was okay when Wiley e. Coyote got an anvil dropped on his head. He just has a few lumps. He's fine. Don't worry. And that's a little bit of what this opening felt like to me. Not... Not to the extreme. It wasn't ridiculous, but there was enough of a a silliness to the whole affair that I believe it absolutely shattered all of the drama that the previous movie built up, which had also been shattered by the passage of a year's worth of time. Yeah. Alfred. 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 Ryan Gay did amazing work as Alfred. Just pleasant all around. Wonderful character. I am on IMDb, if you can't tell, listener, looking up things. <laughs> um, and I can see why a lot of people would enjoy it. It just, I guess the easiest way to say it is it, it offended me as a moviegoer, as someone who has seen the other five films in this series. It didn't, it didn't meet the promise of the previous five movies, as what is presumably the ultimate, you know, climax of the whole series probably the last one of these movies we will get because I mean unless you're actually gonna fucking do the similarian this is it's it but um and then later in the movie like after they stopped focusing so much on the humans for a minute and after the questionable special effects decisions in the wizard fight when they were focusing on the dwarves and what was going on there, what was going on with Bilbo. And Thorin. And, and yeah, that was when it started being really good again. And it pretty much stayed really good. Ooh, until the gold scene. Until the gold scene. And there's this scene where if you watched it on mute, it's great filmmaking. Sure. Thorin is standing on a big floor made of gold. That From they, the end of the last movie when they tried to kill Smaug. When they tried to bury Smaug in gold. And it's this flat, pristine surface, and he's just standing in the middle of it, and the camera angle goes, like, it flashes back and forth, changes angles, goes all Dutch, and then there's this effect of the gold warping into, like, a sinkhole, and Thor and Thorn falling in and trying to drag himself out, but ultimately being consumed by the gold that swallows him up. And then, at the end of it, he just has this... this a understanding but somehow broken look on his face. He takes off the big crown he put on because he's king under the mountain now and tosses it away. That's perfect. That's perfect as is. We understand the character's journey from that. 
But they didn't stop there, listener. They decided to add in the audio, the really the emotional equivalent of the fucking floating talking heads from the first season of The Simpsons. I really expected one to go dental plan at some point. <laughs> it really was, and that's—I mean—that's a trope. It's a classic trope. But we're dealing with better filmmakers who don't need to employ this trope. Again, it becomes jarring. These whispering voices of "You could have been better." Maybe if you weren't such a shit. I always believed in you. Gold I'm, is shitty. Gold is great, and I'm putting it in my mouth now. <laughs> and, I mean, it's... There is a cool visual effect where, like, this, there's a, a visual effect of smog swimming beneath the gold. It's it's intended to show that his spirit is has cursed this gold. It is it is cursed with dragon's greed. And it's and that's affecting Thorin. And that's, that's all you need to get that across. But they, like, hammer home... That, the, 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 the thing smog, you know, I will part with not a single piece of it, not a single coin. It did in three minutes. In fact, I think the actual scene in the movie lasted about the same amount of time. It is equivalent to Emo Spider-Man. Mm, no, Emo Spider-Man was worse. Oh, it was dumber. But that movie was already kind of wacky and slapstick. I... Yeah, I mean, it's a fair comparison. I, 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 I would say they're not entirely exactly equal, but it's no, a fair comparison. but it's in terms of filmmaking, in terms of what we're falling from and what we've fallen to, yeah. I think those distances are equal, even if they're not on the same plane. And a, a, really great, a really great way to show just how far we've fallen in terms of, you know, one series to the next, and how little trust... Peter Jackson has in his audience anymore when he used to trust them much more. Well, the scenes... it, is it Peter Jackson or is it the studio? And how much is the studio mandating? I don't necessarily want to hold any individual responsible. I, dude, I, I, unless I hear otherwise, I'm comfortable holding Peter Jackson at least partially responsible for this. These are, in large part, his babies. That's fair, but the studio did get up their own asses about these movies. They I mean, did. They were delayed by how many years just because they were all being... <laughs> Yeah, you're right. But the scenes in Fellowship where Boromir is being tempted by the ring yeah. are quiet. They're and, whispers, you know. It's, it's And you hear whispers, and those whispers are just fine. Uh, I think they're whispers in the black speech, but there you hear whispers in the back of his head, and you understand that he's being tempted by an outside force, and he's trying to overcome it, but it's dragging him down. They linger on the ring and his face, and you, I mean, he gives dialogue that helps explain his mental process at the time, um, where he shrugs off the ring and talks about how he doesn't care and all that, but the, the actual scenes are mostly just these moments of very stark, quiet filmmaking where they show Boromir's mental journey. And they, to go from those scenes in fucking 2001... To 2014, I think is when the movie came yeah. out. Yeah, 2014. I came out like two weeks ago. What I'm asking, um, and we get this fucking this ham-fisted bullshit. That's honestly, look, the fight with the ring rates is worse. That's my least favorite scene in the movie because that was the only scene that felt like it was insulting my fucking intelligence. And it came after so much good stuff. Like if that scene hadn't been as over the top. As it was, as melodramatic as it was, I may have forgotten the first half an hour of that movie, forty-five minutes ish. And it came, and it came after such good stuff for Thorin because his whole descent into, you know, the the mad Thorin king under the mountain was done really well. Yeah, they even did some stuff which was a little bit more, shall we say, dramatic that works well. There's a point in which Thorne is talking about how he's, you know, not going to give the people of Lake Town the gold he promised them, and he says a line, which is a pretty direct lift from something Smog said before. Uh, like, by my word, I will not part with a single coin, not a single piece of it. That's a pretty direct lift from one of Smog's lines, if memory serves. And they do a filter where Thorin's voice gets, like, undercurrented by Smog's delivery of that line. Because Bilbo is the one who's talking to him and observing him, and there's this realization in his eyes as he says it. That's kind of subtle, and that was a year ago. So, that's fine. I, I, I no, mean, that was in this movie. That was this movie. No, I mean, like, the callback. 
Oh, yeah, the callback to the other thing. Was yeah, the callback right? to the previous line was another I mean, I, th- I think they show it briefly in the beginning, but... It's... And you know what? It's mm. not... It's, it's a teensy bit over the top, but it's, but it's ex- permissible. But it's over the top enough. Yeah. Because it's, it's obviously a character, you know, it's to reinforce a message. And that's, that's about as far as it ever should have gone. Then they went, like, 19 times farther. Yeah, with, with the whole gold room scene. And then after that, the movie's fine. Yeah, it's like, there's these two real low points. The graph of this movie is a line about halfway up the chart. It had spikes a cu- above the chart a couple times, and some really cool shit happens, and then during Billy Connolly's performance. Shit. Um, and then it spikes real far down the li- real far down the chart, too. But I don't feel bad about paying $5 for it. No, not at all. Um, went to a matinee, got a deal. Full movie ticket price, I maybe would have felt a little bit... Mm, yeah. I'm glad... I mean, there was a point where I almost walked out, and I'm not the guy who walks out of films. I'm not. No, you're not. But I... You were taking something, you're not only taking a book that I loved as a child, which has all that nostalgia and all that says, um, you are also taking a film series that I've loved as an adult, and a teenager, I guess, um, and you're, you're fucking it up. You're fucking it up really bad, man. And then they stopped fucking it up, and my rage boner calmed itself down. We didn't have uh, NAR issues, because <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't want to be the guy who walks out of a movie. I know a lot of people brag about that, like, "Oh yeah, I walked out of that one." Why? Because it was a little boring the first ten minutes. Get over yourself. But I mean, this was fucking insulting to me as a moviegoer. To me, now you know what? You, maybe you fucking saw it and you you have no frame of reference, or you've got uh, less of a high standards that you keep these people to. <laughs> I like how it's not it can't be that just you have a different opinion you, there has to be something wrong with you oh no I, I'm saying <laughs> specifically speaking you know maybe you have a different opinion is so vague maybe there are reasons perfectly legitimate reasons it's perfectly legitimate if you chose not to read the books and you only wanted to see the movie um, it's perfectly legitimate if you don't hold filmmakers to that high of a standard I mean that's well it's also possible they didn't think it was bad in the sure place. I mean I don't understand that <laughs> <laughs> From a filmmaking sense, I, I don't understand that. But uh, fair, I'd love to talk to you about it. We have a comment section below. If uh, you thought that section with the ring rates wasn't ugly and kind of sad looking, just please. the ring rates themselves, and the, uh, you know, I'm not even going to try to defend my opinion on the Sauron effect. Look, I don't like it, but whatever. Um, just the ring rates and just the fucking the smog sacking Lake Town stuff. If you were like, those effects were amazing, please give me shit in the comments and I will comment back and we will have ourselves an internet fight. Because I want to see that. Um, but I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's my opinion. But the rest of the movie was perfectly fine. It, yeah. It did the Hobbit ending. Yeah. The performances were, as always, good. Like, Thorin's performance during that ridiculous scene is fine. He's doing a good job. Oh, and Martin Freeman was just... Martin Freeman is, as always, amazing. I mean, like, this movie, so much more than everything else, reminded me why he's he makes such a good Bilbo Baggins. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned this, because this reminds me of something else. When the first Hobbit movie came out, um, my a friend of ours uh, mentioned that he didn't like how much they took away from Bilbo. There were a couple of moments where Bilbo saved the day, entirely, that they kind of gave to Gandalf, or didn't have happen, or toned down a bit. And I wasn't personally bothered by it. I I felt it still served the purpose of the story. But now, after seeing the third movie, I'm glad they did that. Because the first two movies build him being... While he's got a conscience about him, he's not... He's not a hero. He's a... He's... You know, another character Martin Freeman has played. He's he's the everyman. He's yeah, and he really would just rather go home. This is all a bit of a fuss to him, but he's Arthur Dent. Yeah, um, and that's the character he plays. And he might have a good plan that gets them out of things, or he might do something sneaky that ends up being really useful. But he's not a hero until the third movie, where he comes back and calls Thorin on his shit. 
and the performance Martin Freeman delivers there, the delivery of the lines, when he stands there not shaking, not overly resolute, but just frank, and says to Thorin, I'm not afraid of you. And the reaction that you get out of that is just... its It makes it a very much... The Hobbit is about Bilbo coming to terms with being a... a more heroic person, a an adventurer, someone who does things. That's what the book is about, in large part, in addition to just being sort of a fun story for kids. Sure. Um, the movies are about that, too, but they have three fucking movies, so they have the ability to draw it out and make it a more, and make it a more, honestly, a more nuanced character development. Yeah. Bilbo doesn't immediately jump to being a, a hero who saves the day. It takes him some time, and I actually kind of like that change. I do, too. I like it a lot. Because he he makes risky decisions, risky backstabby, shady decisions in like the, the service party rogue. in the service of the greater good, like a good aligned party rogue. And uh, in general, I, I really appreciated the way the film treated that. Um, I I don't really care about their name. What's her name? Ariel Toriel. Toriel. I don't really care about her in general. I don't find her addition to the movie anathema. Some people do. Perhaps. Some people fucking hate her. Uh, I guess I can see why. I mean, it was a bit trite, sure, but you know what? Um, in the face of some of the other shit that happened in the third film, no, not really. Yeah, it was good, perfectly fine. <laughs> um, really, genuinely, pretty well developed when compared to some of the other shit. I mean, it, it wasn't my favorite part Look, by any stretch, but They whatever. wanted a romance subplot, they made a romance subplot, it wasn't terrible, and they didn't have it do anything anyway, because the one-third of the subplot dies. Well, and I, I, I thought it was, um, I thought it was a good way to sort of shape things better for Legolas going into, uh, it gives, Honestly, it helps develop uh, Legolas into a character, because... You, his, you know, he's very zen about shit and fellowship, and he's, and you wonder how he got that way. In the beginning of the Hobbit movies, he's not. He's kind of an asshole. More. Yeah, honestly, this helps soften his edges and makes him understand stuff. You know how in Star Wars you kind of have to watch it, uh, four, five, six, one, two, three. Yeah, I would say that really all you'd be missing out on if you watched the the Hobbit and Lord of the Rings movies one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, actually, four, five, six, one, two, three. Or do you mean like... I mean like the Hobbit movies and then the Lord of the Rings movies. Oh, okay. Um, The only thing that you kind of miss out on is the beauty of the bookends. But then, even still, not really. Because they use the same fucking dialogue in the end. You're introduced to Frodo super early, so you know who he is. It's not like he's a character out of left field. So I think it honestly fits pretty good there, too. It's not as much you of know a... What? I know we, you mentioned we don't have a lot of time, and we don't. That's what I'm going to do. Uh, once, the des- once the Battle of Five Armies comes out on DVD, we have Desolation of Small, don't we? No, I think we rented we it. We rented it? Yeah. I'll, well, I'll rent it or something. One we'll way or another, we'll acquire we'll, the We'll films. get the Hobbit movies. I, have, I think we have the Lord of the Rings movies, or we'll get them. I have the first two expanded deluxe editions. I just never got The Return of the King. Um, Finances were per- not permitting at the time. I, I, it might be a while, it might be several months. I probably won't probably come up on the podcast as like a whole podcast, but when I'm done, I will mention it. I will endeavor to do that. I will watch The Hobbit, um, an unexpected journey, The Hobbit, uh, Desolation of Smog, The Hobbit, Battle of Fire Armies, and then Fellowship of the Ring, Two Towers, and Return of the King in order. And I will tell you what it, what it plays like. I, I think it will be just as good, if not a little bit better. Not a lot but enough to appreciate the nuances of the characters as they flow through the story. I, uh... It'll be interesting. Yeah. Um, I also like the depth of character they gave to the Wood Elf King. Yeah. Like... Like, he was he was not a character in the book. He was a caricature. In yeah, the book. he was. Um, and I, I, liked, I liked him a lot in... The Pie this. Maker. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Ronan. Ronan uh, the Deceiver, yes. Uh, <laughs> but, Lee uh, Pace is an amazing <coughs> actor. Yeah, I can't wait for him to be in more, <coughs> more stuff. But, um, I've had this cough forever. Like, 
If you go back and listen to the last, I don't know, five, six podcasts, you'd probably be like, man, White's is Cough dying? is... Uh... dying? <laughs> White's Cough is the third nerd now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I felt they added a lot to that to the character there. I, it didn't... Command the wheel. Sure. Um, I will say this for it, it didn't drag. No. And that, that's surprising, because it was a long movie with not a lot of basis. Like, yeah. They had, to, they had to pad some shit, and the padding seemed fine. The Return of the King stuff, there were some points where it dragged. Two Towers. The end, the end of Return of the King? Oh my god, no. Like there's, there's not dragging, there's won't fucking die. Because... <laughs> it's like a vampire who you staked and cut the head off of. It's like started, Dracula in Buffy. Yeah, he just won't <laughs> die. He starts to get up, and she's just like... Bah, 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 bah. <laughs> Um, but no, yeah, because it takes you on that emotional roller coaster, and you get that that closure. You're like the movie's over closure that you get when a tale is finally told in full, and then it's like, but wait, there's more. <laughs> oh, we spent a lot of this talking about the Battle of Five Armies specifically, which yeah, makes certainly. sense. But in, yeah, in terms of the Lord of the Rings movies in general, I'd say the draggiest bit is Return of the King, the end of it that won't die. That oh my god, will you please not end? See what I what I what I mean when I say a movie is dragging is when I get bored enough to remember that I'm watching a movie and not sucked into the story. Of it. That's that's a very specific criteria. I, I suppose so. I mean, like I can appreciate. It's usually when things are going slower, when not a lot is happening, when characters I have a hard time caring about or having long conversations about shit that doesn't really matter. And, like, the middle of Return of the King and some of Two Towers has that problem. The end of Return of the King, I wish it would end. It takes forever. I don't feel it's dragging because stuff is happening, but I keep feeling like I should leave the theater and then no. <laughs> it's like, it's too many after credit scenes. Yeah, basically. It's like a it's like a Marvel movie gone wrong. <laughs> they show the little green screen that's like this film was the house lights come up, suddenly they go back down, but there's another after credit scene. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> There's two Samuel L. Jacksons now! They're fighting <laughs> Shit, this next movie's gonna be awesome! Why is he in Lord of the Rings? <laughs> <laughs> we actually made that exact same joke. We were sitting there after the movie was done on the Battle of Five Armies last Friday. And we were sitting there, the movie was over, the credits were up, people were leaving, and these two weren't getting up. And I looked at them and said, I pro I'm betting there's no after credit scene, you guys. We're pretty much done. He's like, and they were like, yeah, we're just, we're just waiting for people to clear out. And then I said, wouldn't it be shit <laughs> if, set, if like, fucking door pops open to back end? It's like, hey, who is it? I told you, who is it, you know, Bilbo being Bilbo at them, and it's like Samuel L. Jackson as Nick Fury. Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> we need you for the Avengers. <laughs> Sadly, that's one of the few crossovers that's unlikely to happen. I don't yeah. think those are owned by Disney. No, they're not. Um, Although you could have, like, um, he could show up in, a, in the next Final Fantasy movie. That could happen. I don't know that it would make much sense for a hobbit of Middle Earth to show up in the middle of modern day Amera Japan. No, 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 not, not uh, Bilbo, Samuel L. Jackson. Oh. Disney, the Great Umbrella. Oh, yeah, Square, okay, that's true. Samuel L. Jackson could show up on Once Upon a Time, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, anything would be better than the Frozen storyline they've been running. I think they're done with that now, aren't they? It, whenever the season's over, we're but in the But anyway, season. Hobbit. Um, yeah, Lord Hobbit. Of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Um. Um, Orlando Bloom doesn't age. I feel like I should point that out. Um, he ages a little bit. Like, he's got some wine on his face. Not many. Like No, not, but he's only like not 32. 14 years worth. Yeah, but he went from like... Actually, more, because they filmed all those films in order. So they started filming Lord of the Rings at like 1999 or 98. So, from, like, 99, 98, I, don't, I actually don't know when they started filming. Um, at, the very, at the very fucking early, latest, it had to be, like, in 2000. To 2014, and he's, he looks pretty much the same, like, after he had a bad weekend. Sure. <laughs> That's, it's scary. He's, I'm pretty sure, actually part elf. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, I liked his performance, though. Uh, my, my favorites, as I said earlier... Fellowship of the Ring, um, 
I'd have to watch them again, but I want to say An Unexpected Journey is probably my favorite of the Hobbit movies. Because it has the most Radagast, and it and has that scene with Gollum. love Radagast for some oh, reason? Oh, I do. I mean, he's just, he's delightful. That's the kind of funny slapstick stuff that that you should add to The Hobbit, because it feels, it feels Lord of the Ringsy. It feels in-universe, you know? No, not really. I suppose he's just as silly as Tom Bombadil would have been. Well, far less silly than Tom Bombadil would have been. Not really, dude. He passes out at one point from, like, I don't know, being too high, and he has bird crap on his face the whole time. Bird poop. A large amount. A waterfall of bird because poop. Because those birds live in his hat. On his face. The whole time. That counts for a lot of silly, okay? Eh. Eh. Whatever, I like the character. Um. I'm not saying you're wrong to like the character, I'm just saying that Bomb that Bombadil would not have been measurably worse. If they had had the opportunity to put Tom Bombadil in the movies, I feel as though the conversation we had some number of weeks ago uh, fits most appropriately. If anybody could carry the frenetic energy of that character. And I realize this man is not, was not British, but exceptions, I'm sure, can be made. I have faith he could do the accent. If they had cast Robin Williams as Tom Bombadil, I think it would have been fine. I think he could have portrayed the violent frenetic energy of the character, as well as the hearty, good-naturedness, kind soul. Without, I gotta bring the two nerds podcast down. I gotta bring the two nerds podcast down to build it up because, listener, just think about that for a few minutes. See that beatific smile, the twinkle in his eye, neath a hearty beard, and his boots. Yeah, and his big stompy stomped boots, as he lovingly caresses hobbits, and plays with the one ring like it ain't no thing. <laughs> oh, but. uh... I think that's a pretty good note to end things on, unless you had something else to say. I really didn't, um, other than being, like, mildly depressed now. <laughs> hey, yeah, you know, you're welcome. Uh, somewhere around here on the internet, probably going up around the same time, we did a fighting games thing. It was supposed to happen earlier in the week, but what a crazy week this has been. This has been the most weirdly busy week in Two Nerds' uh, recent history. Yeah, but uh, hey, we still got two podcasts out for you guys, and we'll come at you again next week with something else. And then the week after, we get to watch a wrestling pay-per-view. Oh, yay. Yay, yay, yay. Joy. Don't worry. Because after we watch the show, you and I will sit down, we'll turn on the computer, we'll hit the record button, and we'll talk about it. And that'll make it a little better. Because everything's better when nerds talk about it. Fuck it, let's go hardcore!